So today's reading is taken from Ezra, chapter 7, verses 1 to 10. Ezra comes to Jerusalem. After these things, during the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra, son of Saria, son of Azariah, son of Hilkiah, the son of Shalom, the son of Zadok, the son of Ahitab, the son of Amariah, the son of Azariah, the son of Mariah, the son of Zerahiah, the son of Asai, the son of Bukai, the son of Abishua, the son of Phineas, the son of Eli Azur, the son of Aaron, the chief priest, this Ezra came up from Babylon. He was a teacher well-versed in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given. The king had granted him everything he asked, for the hand of the Lord his God was on him. Some of the Israelites, including priests, Levites, musicians, gatekeepers, and temple servants, also came up to Jerusalem in the seventh year of the king Artaxerxes. Ezra arrived in Jerusalem in the fifth month of the seventh year of the king. He'd begun his journey from Babylon on the first day of the first month, and he arrived in Jerusalem on the first day of the fifth month, for the gracious hand of his God was on him. For Ezra had devoted himself to the study and observance of the law of the Lord, and to teach in its decrees and laws in Israel. <coughs> Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, for that. I, I can imagine the conversation with Duncan going, it's, it's just a short reading, just 10 verses. Um, it'll be fine. Thank you so much, uh, Sean, for the, all, all those names. And um, do keep Ezra 7 open in front of you. Um, we'll, be, we'll be diving in. Uh, we, we've already worked out what's going on. We've sung it earlier as God's word is preached. Show us Christ. That's what we want, isn't it? That's who we need. Well, as we come to this passage, why don't we pray that we would do that, that we would see Christ in these words and that he would fill our hearts again. Father, help us as we come uh, to a a part of history that we are not familiar with, a, a, a people and a place that are so far removed. Father, help us to see your hand at work. Help us to see um, your, your cosmic plan that brings together uh, all things to your Son. Father, encourage us, we pray. Uh, as we sit under your word this morning, as we hear from you, Show us Christ. Show us Christ, we pray. There's nowhere else that we have to go. Amen. Uh, well, as Duncan said, we're kind of finally, you're beyond halfway through the book, finally about to meet Ezra. It's the kind of the start of Act 2. Um, and that should kind of ring bells. Shouldn't it? That happens in, in great stories sometimes. You know, in The Lion, The Witch, and The Wardrobe, we, we don't meet the lion until two-thirds of the way through. But when we do, when, when suddenly the children see Aslan, it's like, right, now the story's kicking in. This is how it's all going to be resolved. This is how winter's going to come to an end. And so to an extent, as, as we suddenly see in, in the beginning of chapter 7, this, uh, in this short passage, Ezra arrives, we should be like, right, here we go, here's a change coming. Uh, here, is, here is something that's going to be different. I mean, just as a recap, in chapters 1 to 6, uh, what we've seen is God's people who were stuck in exile in Babylon returning. The, the first kind of group coming home. God moved the heart of King Cyrus. He, he allowed the Jews to return out of exile. They, they've rebuilt the temple. Yeah, yeah there was some opposition there were struggles along the way, but the temple is rebuilt. And last week, do you remember, Duncan uh, showed us that they, they could remember and rejoice 
for the first time in 70 odd years, they celebrated the Passover festival to re remember God redeeming them, bring them out of slavery. And now we come to the beginning of chapter 7, and we see these words, during the reign of Artaxerxes, after these things, during the reign of Artaxerxes, or after these things, well, actually it's about 60 years later. Between the end of chapter 6 and the beginning of chapter 7, we have about 60 years of gap in the narrative. Now, if you want to read about what happened then, you can get into the book of Esther. A great way to do that would be to use Karen's devotionals that she wrote on the book, um, available from 10 of those and other places. And, um, but go and get stuck into the story. It, it's, that's, that, that's where it fits in between 6 and 7. And what we have now is the second return of exiles back from Babylon, brought by Ezra. And actually, Ezra is closer to, in time-wise, um, Nehemiah than he is to Zerubbabel at the beginning. They will be contemporaries within the decade. And Ezra gets quite the build-up, doesn't he? He gets quite the build-up. He is in the priestly line. That's what all those names are. You know, it's not just any old Ezra. Do you see that in verse 6? It's this Ezra, as, as if there's kind of like a whole crowd of them. We need to distinguish which one it is that we're talking about. You know, not, not Ezra the guy who's the stonemason or Ezra the guy who cleans the toilets. No, this is this Ezra who is the son of, the son of, the son of, all the way back through Zadok, all the way to Aaron. He is in the line of the high priests. This Ezra. And priests had kind of like a twofold role. That firstly, they had a kind of an intermediary thing between God and the people. They would do all the sacrificing stuff in the temple. But secondly, and this is what the focus is on here, the priests were there to teach. And Ezra is a teacher par excellence. He, he is um, studied and versed. Look down at verse 6. He's well versed in the law of Moses. And verse 10, look, he had devoted himself to the study and observance of the law of the Lord and to teaching its decrees and laws in Israel. He, he, he was devoted to the law of the Lord. And so introducing Ezra in this way and, and making much of his teaching credentials works as a hinge in the narrative. Chapters 1 to 6 was about the people coming back, storing the temple and getting worship going again. And from this point on, we're going to see actually, we're going to focus on what it looks like to live as one of God's people back from exile. Yeah, this is the purpose of the law of Moses, the, the law of the Lord. It, yeah, it shows the people what life should be like. And they need reminding. Remember the time frame. You know, 70 years in exile, and now it's been 60 years since the first return. But the law, which we have as the first five books of our Bibles, that would have been forgotten by many, unheard of by most. Ezra's job is going to be to teach them so that they know how to live. Now, ultimately, this kind of kicks off and culminates in, in Nehemiah 8. Um, you, you can sort of read ahead if you want. You know, the people gather and Ezra gets up on a big kind of platformy thing and reads the law to the, all the people. But there's plenty to be done in the weeks building up to that. And so here's the big question this morning. Why? But why do we need, why do they need this? Why do we need this Ezra to be sent back from Babylon? What, why do the people need to hear from him? Why do they need to be taught the law? Why do they need to draw close to God? Why do they need to live for him? You know, why is this so important that God again acts in history to cause Artaxerxes to send Ezra back? We'll see more of that next week. Well, I think it's very simple. Why? Well, because living according to God's words brings God's blessing. Living according to God's words 
brings God's blessing. Look at Ezra as an example. Look, we, we see, look, the hand of the Lord his God was on him in verse 6. And we see why in verse 9 and 10. The gracious hand of his God was on him, for Ezra had devoted himself to the study and observance of the law of the Lord. He had literally devoted himself to it. He had set his heart upon God's word, reading God's word, reading his law, and then observing it, doing it, carrying it out, fulfilling it. And because of this, God's gracious hand was on him. He was living according to God's word, and that brought God's blessing. Now, look, there's a significant danger here at this point. You know, we could kind of leave it there, get home early, have a big coffee. You know, we could jump straight to us, and we have a tendency to do that, don't we? We read the Bible, read the Old Testament, we find the heroes, and we go, what were they like? That must be talking about me. You know, we could quickly make that jump, couldn't we, and say, look, here we go, well done, you've come to church, be like Ezra, stick with God's word, just read the Bible, do what it says, then you'll be blessed. Job done. And I guess that's kind of okay. I mean, it is, I mean it's true to some extent, isn't it? But something being true doesn't necessarily make it unburdensome. Look, <laughs> this will be hard to believe, but bear with me. Um, I once looked into running a marathon. Um, it was quite a while ago, um, uh, and because uh, I was a man, and therefore um, arrogant, I was like, well, if I'm going to run a marathon, I'm going to do it in sub four hours. I'm not going to be one of these guys who kind of like crawls around in eight hours um, and think, you know, I, I was going to do it properly. So I spent a bit of time looking into this. I mean, it was quite, it was a long time ago, before I met, well, anyway. But look, all the info I needed was out there. Okay, I, I find if I ate the right stuff, did all the stretching and recovery, stuck to the training program, you know, got the right trainers, look, look, I could have, I could have run a sub four hour marathon. If I'd stuck to all the information I could find, if I'd found all the right train, all that kind of stuff, no doubt about it, but, as I looked at what was required, you know, I thought, man, I can't be bothered. <laughs> I can't be bothered. It's too much. You know, I had all the information, and actually, if I'd stuck to it, I would have got there. I used to be young and fit. But I couldn't keep that up. You know, people who do, fair play. But to some extent, that's the problem we've got this morning if we jump straight from Ezra to us. You know, read the Bible, do what it says, and you'll be blessed. It's, it's like the marathon training schedule. You know, it might well be true if you stick to it, but you know, it might possibly bring some results, but it would be burdensome. It would be a weight hanging off you. Like, imagine if that really was the heart of the Christian faith. Maybe you think it is. Look, if I tried to convince you that was, that was all there is, wouldn't that just make your heart feel heavy? It ends up being a burden, doesn't it? Wouldn't you leave depressed? Because I mean, let's be honest, it doesn't work. Not because the Bible is wrong, but because we are, look, <laughs> you know, all you've got to do is do everything the Bible says and you'll be okay is a disaster because we can't do it. And we know that. We can't live our lives utterly devoted to everything God says in his words. We just can't keep it up. Even the most dedicated and committed of us will end up falling short. We can't do it. So look, if we try and, uh, and use Ezra as a model to copy, we will end up miserable. Actually, as we'll see over the next few weeks, it ends up pretty miserable for Ezra anyway, and the Jews. There is no happy ending by the time you get to the end of the book of Nehemiah. Read through. 
And it's one of the big themes of the rest of this story is that the people just can't commit. You know, they try and Nehemiah rocks back, goes back to Babylon for a bit, comes back and it's a disaster again. It's just, we can't do it. And so instead of seeing Ezra as a model to copy, we need to see him as a prototype, as a forerunner, as a shadow, a, a pointer to the man who was able to do these things perfectly. You know, as we read Ezra and realize that, that living according to God's word brings God blessing, we should be left wondering, who, who can do that? Who can make that happen? And so we end up looking at Jesus. Show us Christ. And we look to Jesus and we see, like Ezra, he knew the law. Even as a kid, he was in the temple debating with the teachers. You know, he delighted in God's law. He kept it fully. There was no sin found in him. Jesus taught God's law to others. In the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 and 6 and 7. He did what no one else is able to do. Ezra points us forward to Jesus. Jesus did it. He did live perfectly according to God's word. And that is really good news for us because like Ezra, Jesus is a priest. And not any old priest. No, he is the ultimate high priest. In Hebrews 10, we read this. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when this priest... Jesus had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins. He sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. This priest, this Jesus, because he was without fault, because he was spotless, he was able to be, as we saw last week, our Passover lamb. Remember and rejoice. Jesus was the perfect sacrifice that was able to finally, once and for all, pay for the sins of the world. The great priestly line that we just saw in Ezra, the one that, that gets to this guy said, this Ezra. Look, that was ineffectual, actually. Yeah, they had to offer sacrifices day after day after day because they never had any lasting effects. But Jesus is different. On our behalf, by living perfectly according to God's word, Jesus is able to finally bring us God's blessing. We couldn't do it for ourselves. We couldn't possibly hope to follow God's law perfectly and bring his favor. But praise God, Jesus has done it. And what is the blessing he brings? Well, the equation changes significantly here. See, Jesus brings God's blessing. And God's blessing is that we are able to live according to his word. Do you see? But do you see the difference? Do you, do you see the nuance? Instead of struggling under the burden of trying to live according to God's word to bring God's blessing, Jesus has made it possible to enjoy living according to God's word as a blessing and not as a burden. Do you see? The blessing that Jesus brings to us by keeping the law, by being our great high priest, by, by giving us himself as a final sacrifice, is to put his spirit in our hearts. And as it says in Hebrews, he's working to make us more holy, to make us more like him. If we turn to him and we accept his sacrifice on our behalf, 
rescue, which is going to mean acknowledging our brokenness and our need for his rescue, turning away from our sin. We are given the power and the freedom by his spirit to live according to his words. As we saw in the family slot, we, we, we've been redeemed. Redemption means we are set free. Not set free to do as we please, but set free to live according to God's words. And that's really good news. It's really good news. But I think sometimes we think that sticking to God's word is part of the cost of being a Christian. I think sometimes we think that giving up sin is part of the sacrifice that's required to follow Jesus. No. That, that's not a cost, that's not a sacrifice. Living according to God's word is the blessing. Being able to do that is glorious. Because I said we could have ended this 10 minutes ago with a read your Bible, do what it says as a burdensome kind of duty. But do you see how Jesus transforms this into that you can read your Bible and you can do what it says. You, you can do this now in my strength and power, says Jesus. I've given you the freedom to do so. I've set you free for this. It's such good news because God's word to us, his design for us is perfect. He made us. So it stands to reason that, that he understands what's best for us, and it makes sense to listen to him, right? We can enjoy living as he intended. Do you believe that? Do you really believe that God knows what's best for you? Look, our culture tells us that the Bible is outdated and archaic. You know, surely society has moved on from a book that was written 2,000 years ago. And we can kind of fall into the trap, can't we, of thinking like that as Christians? We can end up thinking that God's word is a burden rather than a blessing. You know, maybe you're looking into Christianity and that's your fear. Maybe you've been joining us online and you're looking in and you're thinking, but if I jump on board this, you know, is this actually going to curtail my freedom? Is this going to mean I have to give loads of stuff up? Well, don't believe that lie. God's word is good. You know, his design for life, it cannot be bettered. You know, he wants you to grow in holiness and Christ-likeness. And that is it's a beautiful thing. You know, time doesn't permit us to go into huge amounts of detail uh, here. But look, what, one thing, let's look at Romans 12. Paul here gives us a picture of what life in the power of the Spirit looks like for Christians. Romans 12, verse 9, just a few verses here. This is what the church community should look like. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor. Serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Don't be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Look, go home, look at that later. Isn't it stunning? Isn't it gorgeous? God's design for us is to be generous and servant-hearted, to, to be devoted to one another, to mourn and celebrate together, to ignore class systems and just see each other as brothers and sisters, as a family, to love one another deeply, to be joyful, to be patient, to be faithful. Look, if you can bring me a better design for life, I'd love to see it. Imagine a world that lives like that. 
Think of all the things that we wouldn't have to worry about. Think of how the world will be transformed if people live like that. God knows what he's doing. It's stunning. It's the best way to live. Or maybe it all sounds too good to be true. Perhaps it sounds impossible to live out. Well, look, it's not easy. We'll mess up, we'll fall short, we'll stumble in this life. Because we're being prepared for the next. But because of the power God has given us through Jesus in his spirit, gloriously, wonderfully. We are free from the burden of having to keep God's law and keep God's word to bring his blessing. Jesus has turned it on its head. It is possible to live like this because God's blessing to us, if we are in Christ, is that we are able to live according to his word. We can embrace his design and live as he as intended. Isn't that wonderful? Well, look, as the band come up, let me pray before we sing our final song. Father, we praise you that we are not left on our own, that we are not responsible for bringing in your favor, that we don't have to earn your love for us. Father, thank you that you have blessed us through Jesus, our great high priest. Thank you that you've given us the gift of your spirit so that we can live according to your word. We can live according to your desire. We have been set free from our slavery to ourselves. And given the chance to live for you in glorious freedom. Father, help us to live lives that bring glory to your name. Amen.